All right, guys, this is week 12. We are diving into the second wave of feminism, abstract expressionism, as well as pop art. And we'll be breaking down some of those elements, um, some really fun art. Good to see Andy Warhol today. Woo! So last week we discussed sort of post-World War II and how um, Francis Bacon and Alberto Giacometti sort of worked um, in the constraints of what happened after World War II. And so now we're moving really into the phase where people are really affected, really thinking about what um, art after World War II really means. So Barnett Newman said that artists of his generation felt the moral crisis of the world in shambles, a world devastated by a Great Depression and a fierce World War, and it was impossible at the time to paint the kind of paintings that we were doing, flowers, reclining nudes, and people playing the cello. This is our moral crisis in relation to what to paint. The U.S. had entered, when they entered into World War II in 1942, they were still painting in social realism and regionalism that we talked about. However, it became ins insufficient to talk about their current life after World War II. Um, and so they really changed their art and how they were thinking about art and art history. So there was also still that fear of the use of technology. We talked about that, um, I believe, ever so briefly when we talked about World War I and that there were such horrific deaths due to technology and having tanks and machine guns and all these things. So there's definitely still a lot of that fear um, and pain that came sort of after World War II. Additionally, something that's really important about art and art history is that after World War II, New York becomes the center for modern art and sort of contemporary art after that. So this whole time we've been talking about how France and Paris have had all these strong um, artists and figures in our history and we see that drastically change because of World War II. So not only are artists moving to the United States to get away from um, Nazi occupation, but you also have cultural centers that are being destroyed because of the Nazis or the looting in museums. And so the center of art and art history really becomes New York during this time. And so we'll see how um, American artists sort of adapt to that so that we have American artists, but we also have European artists who have fled here um, from Europe as well. We also have a big revolution that's going to occur uh, during this time period, which is the second wave of feminism. And this really begins because of the feminine mystique by Betty Friedan in 1963. We have Betty Friedan writing this, um, and in 1957 she asks um, to conduct a survey for her Smith College classmates at their 15th anniversary reunion, and she finds that people are really unhappy with their lives particularly women, and she had intended to just publish an article about this book, um, but had found out so much information, um, or about this idea, found out so much information that she published this really revolutionary book that kind of jump-started the second wave of feminism. The reason that she has this idea is really because when you think about life during World War II for women, they were asked to go into many jobs and fields. There were tons of women engineers and working in technology because those roles needed to be filled by women because men were off fighting in World War II. And so you'll see magazines and advertisements that are really promoting women and women uh, to um, join different jobs. You have figures like Rosie the Riveter, right, that comes out, we can do it, really promoting women in the workplace. Now, this really drastically changes after World War II because we have troops returning from Europe um, and marrying um, their sweethearts and having kids, which is the baby boomers. And the advertising and the government and society really want women to go back into the homes um, and raise children and so that men can have their jobs back. And so they're really going to encourage women to go back into the home again. And so we see that in advertising um, and in sort of the roles that different government programs play. So we see in all these advertisements that women are objectified, they're pushed back into the homes, um, and really women start to think that this is their place and this is their role. And so they do this, right? They move out of these jobs that they've been working and move back into the homes. 
So you can see all of these 1950s housewife advertisements that are very sort of um, very oppressive and sort of treat women um, in a very negative manner. Um, like wives, look this ad over carefully. Circle the items you want for Christmas. Show it to your husband. If he does not go to the store immediately, cry a little. Not a lot, just a little. He'll go. He'll go. And um, so like all these cooking supplies that she might want. If you've ever seen the film Mona Lisa Smile, it really gets into some of these issues uh, from 2003. And if you want, you can go um, and watch. Um, I'll have all these links again to help you out with some of these information. Um, this one isn't as necessary, but it's a great scene. Um, this film is really about questioning women's roles through the lens of Wellesley College students in the 1950s and their study of art history. Uh, Julie Roberts being their professor and sort of teaching these women um, about art and art history and learning sort of that these women um, believe that their roles in college are to get a husband, a PhD, putting your husband through. Um, and that once they get a husband that they drop out of college or they're not pursuing college. And so um, you can go and find this, uh, watch this link um, about when Julia Roberts as the professor is confronted with some of these issues where they say that they were um, born to fill these roles. So I'll have that link up on the Moodle. You also have even magazine advertisements. This is from um, Mrs. Harper's Bazaar from 1960. If you're a woman, woman, don't vote. In the pre-19th Amendment era, the American woman was placid, sheltered, and sure of her role in American society. She left all the political decisions to her husband, and he, in turn, left all the family decisions to her. Today, a woman has to make both family and the political decisions, and it's too much for her. So this article uh, encouraged women not to participate in voting or their sort of political right to vote, which they had gained in the first wave of feminism. You had these insane statistics where average marriage age was 20, 14 million women engaged by 17, college uh, in 47% in 1920, 35% in 1958, 60% um, dropped out of college once they were married, this PhD, right? Um, women having more children passing India in birth rate, and 3 out of 10 women dyed their hair blonde. And you can go through um, some of these advertisements and commercials and see how much um, women are pushed to be feminine in the homes to have this particular idea of who they should or shouldn't be. Um, Metricol being one of them. Metricol was a diet drink in which I encourage women to drink it um, on the go to keep their slim figure. Um, one I think I don't think either of these have it but one of the advertisements was face it you've got to stop eating. Um, which is terrible. So, and people sort of grew very quickly sick of this uh, pink gooey nonsense. Um, but here is an advertisement that I'll have on the link page um, of watching people, AKA women who are secretaries, um, drink Metricol. You also have suburbia becoming a um, big part of why you're women, moving women back into the homes. Um, American women, and families in general are moving away from cities because the GI Bill is going to guarantee home loans. And you have these mass produced homes um, for these families this, of this baby boom, right? All these people are having kids and building these massive suburban areas where all the houses look exactly the same. Um, and these people get these really sort of low loans um, to be able to purchase these homes. And you can see like, they're almost identical, right? In how far they're spaced apart, in which way they're shaped, um, et cetera. So this is from um, Khan Academy. Built using the principles of assembly line mass production, Levittown went from a potato field to a community of aid 2,000 people in less than a decade. Construction proceeded according to 27 distinct steps, from pouring a concrete slab foundation to spray paint the drywall. Trees were planted every 28 feet. Every house in the division had exactly the same floor plan. Residents reported that at night they sometimes walked into the wrong house by accident. With all of the cost-saving measures, the earliest Levitt townhouses were only $7,000 or $29 per month for a mortgage. Oh my god, I wish. Compared to the going rate of $90 per month for an apartment in the city. So you can imagine even planting a tree, right, every so many feet is insane. And so... 
these suburban neighborhoods were built for this baby boom and also moving women back into the house. Whoops, sorry, I don't know how I did that. Give me one second. So, what is the feminine mystique then, which Betty Friedan's book uh, is titled, is that inherently women are content as oppressed mothers and housewives. There is this reoccurring idea over and over again um, that women should be back in the household, that they're happy there, um, and women were supposed to just act like they were happy. And what was happening was psychologists were finding uh, that women were oppressed. Uh, there was this housewife syndrome. Women felt invisible with no personality. They're blaming women's recent dissatisfaction on the fight for women's rights. They were blaming that women were getting um, too much power, right? Don't vote. It's making you, it's making you sad and depressed. Um, and also, a strange, like I was saying, a strangely a number of psychiatrists stated that in their experience, unmarried women patients were happier than married ones. And they were kind of shocked and like, oh, I don't know why that is. And Betty Friedan was like, this is the reason, right? When you go in and you see these women who are pretending to be happy, who are not fulfilling the roles that they want to be fulfilling, they're stuck in the home, maybe they had careers during World War II, they're inherently depressed. Now, of course, this doesn't apply to every single person, and every individual person is different, but there was this overall oppression that was going on with women that was making them inherently um, upset and this feeling of being trapped. So this book really jump starts the second wave of feminism um, from the 1960s to sort of the 1980s slash 1990s. Um, and so you have um, art being created because of this wave of feminism, which we're really going to dive into next week um, with Judy Chicago and Woman House. But we'll see how um, the feminine mystique really influences art in our history sort of um, next week. But it's sort of a start to thinking about how society is being run at this time and then how art then is sort of progressing. So the first artistic movement we're looking at, we're looking at two big ones today, is abstract expressionism. Artists sort of felt alienated by the old systems and forms of expression and were led to explore new ideas, as I talked about before. Um, expressionism, cubism, constructivism, and surrealism were guides to sort of how they moved forward. You'll see sort of surrealism and the use of the subconscious in abstract expressionist work. They were drawn to organic, abstract, and autonomous surrealists, uh, Mata, Miro, and Masson. Um, Mata helped introduce the idea of psychic automatism to abstract expressionism, meaning you're sort of digging into your unconscious when you're creating a work and you're moving your hand unconsciously um, from your thoughts, right? And then it's a creation of what you feel inside about a landscape or an idea or whatever that may be. Americans were less concerned with the new method as means of tapping into the unconscious than as a liberating procedure that could lead to the exploration of new forms. And critics, a large part of the art scene and developers of taste. What we're going to see, um, especially in this presentation, is Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg and how they really influence what's important in art and art history and taste. And we'll see um, Clement B Greenberg fall pretty hard next week, um, which is fabulous. <laughs> Um, so there's kind sort of two sections of abstract expressionism that we're going to talk about. And this is gestural painters versus color field painters. With the gesture painters, they're concerned in different ways with spontaneous and unique touch of the artist, his or her handwriting, and the emphatic texture of the paint, balance of spontaneity and forethought, controlled and unexpected. So we're going to be talking about Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning, but you also have artists like Franz Klein. Color field painters are concerned with abstract statement in terms of large, unified color, shape, or area. Um, Mark Rothko is probably the first person that comes to mind for you. Barnett Newman, Still, Adolf Gottlieb, Motherwell, Ead Reinhardt, and we're going to be talking about uh, some females that fit into that as well. Female artists. And although they weren't all sort of united... Um, under the same idea of what they should or shouldn't do with art. They were united by their belief that abstract art could express universal timeless themes, even as its most abstract art could convey a sense of the whole range of human emotional experiences. So really the first artist we're going to focus on is Willem de Kooning. He's a central figure who comes to the U.S. in 1926. He doesn't exhibit until 1948, but he's big behind the scenes and working with other artists like Pollock. And... Um, he was not only interested 
in abstraction, but also figurative. So what we're going to see is he's not going to move totally towards abstract art. He didn't think that they had to be mutually exclusive, um, but he is going to dabble in sort of both sides. So this is the first wor work uh, that we're going to talk about. This is painting from 1948. And he talks about how even abstract shapes must have likeness. So this is a work um, in which the paint drips and bleeds and congeals in sort of solid forms and dissolves into diaphanous streaks. Uh, recognizable forms still exist. Uh, there are some different sources that say this is a glove and this is a hat. You can definitely see a hat here, right, with the brim. Um, so he's playing with figurative references that are being abstracted into these big sort of bulky shapes, right, kind of feeling like cubism sort of at this state. He also works a lot with figures of women. And so he spent an extensive amount of time studying um, portraits by French artists at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he focused on this seated figure in the first of his series. So this being um, one of his main figures here on the left. She's sort of awkwardly posed. Her arms, legs, and breasts exist as abstract shapes in a flattened space. You have the interest in portraying nature as simultaneously creative and destructive. Um, the Met says, although the figure is recognizable as a woman, de Kooning's arrangement of form, line, and color gives the effect of a body coming together and falling apart. So you can really start to see his breakdown of the human form into abstraction, um, but not fully yet. We're going to see it more in this next work, which is the one I want you to really focus on. So this is Woman 1 from 1950 to 1952. And it's this really monumental image of a seated woman in a sundress um, in his sort of maybe repellent and arresting evoca evocation of women as sex symbol and fertility goddess. At the same time, the strip of silver metallic paint along the right edge of the canvas in since undecidedly quotidian setting. Does it feel like she is potentially in a locus of space? It kind of looks like she's on a chair, right, with legs. And here's the door. And he worked for sort of 18 months kind of scraping and revising and scraping and revising. And I've read some sources that talk about how it's kind of a battle, right, of color, of um, brush stroke. You can sort of see de Kooning struggling with this work and working hard to sort of get it where he wants it to be. Some artists didn't really like this work, didn't think it was abstract enough, that he was kind of moving backwards into figure painting. Um, but this became sort of a monumental work for him. And it was a huge painting. Um, in these sort of massive white, gray, yellow, orange, blue, green, blue, and pink streaks, and really kind of this reverence and fear because it's this massive portrait. Maybe it's a goddess as well, like Venus or a nude, um, and really this focus on the female body, um, like his predecessors, like Manet, Matisse, Picasso, Kirchner, who made the female body the locus of aesthetic experimentation, right? Using the female body to abstract, to rethink art, to rethink form. There's definitely, um, de Kooning kind of talks about this work um, and thinking about sort of the dual nature of sexuality. There's definitely like this banal and shocking that kind of coexists with um, beauty and the female body and identity. And it sort of depends he has this sort of way of using slashing strokes and strong lines and color. It's very dramatic. It's very intense. Does it feel misogynistic? Does it feel vulgar? People sort of didn't get it. There's Maybe there's some connection between humor and misogyny. Takuding said, beauty becomes petulant to me. I like the grotesque. It's more joyous. Um, when MoMA bought the work in 1953, the committee found the picture quite frightening, but it felt that it had a timeless, or it had an intense vitality and liked the quality of the color. So it kind of depends on how you look at it, how you understand it. Is it objectifying and violent? I mean, like when I look at this, it becomes like, uh, why did you make the face like this, de Kooning? Um, why would you not think that people would find it semi-violent? Um, and misogynistic and grossly unattractive um, in some capacity, um, but it sort of depends on your interpretation and how you view this work because it is quite beautiful, um, but it's... The next artist we're going to talk about is sort of a 
classic artist. Everyone's heard of him, right? Jackson Pollock. Um, he really becomes one of the main figures of abstract expressionism, sort of the most famous and most well-known. And we're going to talk about sort of the reasons why he becomes so famous um, and why he becomes this sort of emblem of American art at this time. So he goes to work with Thomas Hart Benton, who we talked about last week and this work, American Today. And Pollock comes from Wyoming and he studied with him and he rejected his ideas and saw that um, he wanted to think more about abstraction. So this relation between Pollock's abstract arabesques and Baton's rhythmic figurative patterns connects sort of um, Pollock's work and how he thinks about it. So you can see the strong movement in Benton's work come out um, in Pollock's work. Pollock also works for the Work Progress Administration. We have to talk about a little bit giving um, jobs to uh, artists. You also have a big figure in Jackson Pollock's life, who we're going to talk about a little later, which is Lee Krasner. He marries her in 1945. And there are a couple of scholars like Anna C. Chave, who says that she was sort of the mastermind behind her husband's success. And we're going to talk about her art. She's someone who's not talked about frequently. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you've never heard of her. Um, but this is her sitting in the background of this photograph, if you've ever seen it before. And we're going to talk about her art a little later here. So early on, this is Guardians of the Secret from 43, Oil on Canvas. This is some of his early art that was kind of figurative, that had brutal energy. It kind of looks like it's a ceremony, a figure standing on either end of this large rectangle. So kind of these figures potentially standing here, very sort of abstract. Um, this large rectangle might be an altar or a table or a funerary pyre or some sort. And um, you have this little dog reclining below there. You can definitely see the dog, luckily, by his little head. And he covered the canvas with this sort of calligraphy and cryptic marks, like primitive hieroglyphic language. Um, and so he was really thinking about abstraction, but hadn't totally abstracted his work yet and what he becomes sort of well known for. So this is sort of the work that you can think of as containing the same energy as um, Hart Breton's work as we sort of move into Pollock's early work. Now, how does Pollock go from this to becoming sort of this icon of art history and this sort of famed figure? There's sort of a couple different reasons why Jackson Pollock became so famous. And we're going to touch on three um, for this presentation. And um, I'm sure there are plenty others that you can think of or that um, have been sort of developed over time. But really, we're going to look at three of them just uh, for time's sake. Uh, first is the artistic landscape after World War II. Pollock embodied an American expressionism of the alienated, misunderstood, and tragic romantic genius. He was from Wyoming. He People considered him a cowboy figure. He always had a cigarette in his mouth. He was really seen as an international symbol of American painting and an icon and a purely American artist, right? He's not from Europe. He didn't move there during World War II. He's been here all this time. He grew up in the United States in a very um, rural landscape in Wyoming. And so he becomes an icon of America um, and of American art. He also paints a very famous mural in 1943 um, for Peggy Guggenheim, who's a big time art collector at the time. She produced this linen canvas for him to use and dictated the size, and he produced the work that year. And you can see him again starting to move towards some of his gestural painting that we talked about. This is Peggy Guggenheim here with Pollock. And this really helped him to sort of gain recognition in the art world and to sort of start to be seen by different people and critics. And this, of course, sort of leads to Clement Greenberg, who I mentioned previously, who is this world-renowned art critic after he published his work, Avant-Garde and Kitsch, in 1939. And Greenberg really promotes Pollock as an artist and as the symbol of American art. Um, this is from Khan Academy 2, I believe. 
the influential mid 20th century art critic Clement Greenberg, a close friend of Frankenthaler and Pollock, we'll talk about Frankenthaler a little bit, believed that an art made after the trauma of the Second World War was going to have any real impact on the social consciousness of Americans. It would have to be radically have to radically change and move towards the abstract. For Greenberg, abstraction could reach a more universal and expansive mode of visual communication. And so Greenberg really saw Pollock as um, the new authentic America. So here is Pollock here, Greenberg here. Uh, this is Greenberg's girlfriend at the time, Helen Frankenthaler, and Lee Krasner, who's Pollock's wife. So here's them at the beach. And this was another group um, of individuals that Clement Greenberg promoted as new art in art history. Of course, look at all these men. Poor little lady here. All men and Jackson Pollock smack in the middle, right? He is the one that Clement Greenberg is really going to promote as um, the emblem of art history at this time and abstract expressionism. And so in 1949, he becomes famous through Clement Greenberg really promoting his work, through sort of gaining Guggenheim's recognition, through him being American. Um, in 1949, Life magazine publishes this article, Jackson Pollock, is he the greatest living painter in the United States? And even in the first line, I think it says, uh, a highly recognized critic states that, um, that he's the best artist, um, living painter in the United States, and then displays his work. So after this, um, his fame sort of skyrockets. He's also featured, um, like in Vogue and other sources. I love this spread. I don't know why, um, where they combine the paintings by Pollock um, with Vogue and um, Cecile Beaton and her art. And you can see like all these really fantastic images of women in these gorgeous gowns in front of Jackson Pollock paintings, which I think is phenomenal and really gorgeous. Um, sorry, Getty, I couldn't find a better image. In 1951, he's starting to gain more and more recognition, and um, this film is produced. It's only about 10 minutes, so go and watch it. I will include it in that link um, document. And it's called Jackson Pollock 51 of 1951, where you can see him painting. Um, Hans Namuth really wants to capture um, action painting, and we're going to talk about what that is in a moment. But really sort of the process of... Um, Jackson Pollock and how he produces his drip paintings because this is really obviously what he becomes well known for. So when you watch this video there's this great scene where um, Hans Namuth uh, videotapes underneath Pollock of him on sort of this fiberglass see-through canvas and you can see him sort of paint and how his movements are. It's just really sort of fascinating to watch so I'll include that link um, in the links as well. And you can see he would lay his canvas on the floor and paint um, with his gestures. And so you could even see that the floor of some of his studios were just coated in paint, um, which is insane. So during this time in 1952, oh goodness, Harold Rosenberg um, publishes The American Action Painter in 1952, where he proclaims this sort of idea of action painting, um, which Pollock is well known for doing. Uh, many of the painters were Marxists, WA unions, artists, congresses. They have been trying to paint society. Others have been trying to paint art, cubism, post-impressionism. It amounts to the same thing. A big moment came when it decided to paint, just to paint. The gesture on the canvas was a gesture of liberation from value, political, aesthetic, moral. On the canvas was not a picture, but an event. And so all of these things, like Harold Rosenberg, Clement Greenberg, really become why Pollock becomes such an icon of art history at this time. And so you can see in his works um, sort of the power of action painting of these strokes, right, in the way that he uses intensely thick um, paint and canvases and loads it up over and over and over to get the effect that he wants. This is Lavender Mist. Um, this is one of his breakthrough paintings. And although it's not um, purple or no lavender in the work, because of the webs of black and white and russet orange silver and stone blue, it kind of radiates a glow of lavender mist, which uh, Clement Greenberg suggested as the title. Really something that um, Pollock is well known for is sort of finding these little bits of um, 
interests and objects that drop into his canvases. Um, in Lavender Mist, he signed his work with his handprint. So in this upper right corner, you can see it here, um, kind of hard to see, this is why I got this other picture. You can see his hands that he has printed onto here. And when you go through all of these works and start to look at them, this is Autumn Rhythm, which is another famous work of his, you can start to see sort of the bits and pieces of how abstract expressionism becomes such a symbol and how Pollock does, because all of his works are embedded with pieces of debris. Um, it becomes this moment, right, he's producing this work, that's all about chance and intuition and control and painting um, your feelings. And he always had a cigarette in his mouth. And so he was always dropping things in the canvas, in the paint. Um, so these bits of studio debris become part of the work itself. So cigarette butts, ashes, pastry wrappings, um, even insects become embedded in the painting without public sort of knowing. And he leaves it there, right? Knowing that it's there. He leaves it there and he becomes a sort of part of the improvisation, this action, this creation in these moments of sort of intense connection with the canvas and ideas. So you can go to some of these websites that I've posted um, here and in sort of the link because you just start to look through some of these and it's just hilarious that you can get sort of up close to the painting and look at right the thick brush strokes and the thick paint that he's using. Some of them not as much, right? Some of them um, have different textures here. But like, for example, here's a bug that died in the canvas, um, a housefly. And so you can see these pits, bits of, de goodness, debris that are found in his canvases. I watched a documentary once that talked about how you can tell some of his works um, and what years he made them because of which objects are embedded in the canvas. Like he had like a polar bear rug or something and so like pieces of the hair got embedded in the canvases so um it's crazy to think about all the objects that are um embedded in these canvases like here again um here's a skeleton key that's in there here's a top of a paint tube uh, some nails it's like a coin to me oh that's a coin sorry coin here are nails Here's a cigarette butt, which happened all the time. Pushpins and thumbtacks, etc. So you can see that as Pollock is making these sort of momentous works, that um, the sort of impulse and movement and chaos sort of leads to these moments of um, objects trapped in the paint. So. As I previously mentioned, Lee Krasner is an artist in her own right, though is well known uh, for being the wife of Jackson Pollock. And they're married in 1945, and um, they have this sort of very famous and tumultuous relationship. But um, Lee Krasner was an artist in herself. And so in, uh, let's see, 1956, so about the meme, married for 11 years, uh, Jackson Pollock dies in a car crash. He has gained sort of so much fame um, and he had a serious issue with alcoholism um, and he eventually um, dies in this car crash with his girlfriend who he's cheating on Lee Krasner with, um, Ruth Klingman. And so you have sort of this tumultuous relationship between Lee Krasner and Pollock and she's worked hard to preserve um, his sort of memory and um, interest but she has produced a lot of really monumental work on her own um, separate from um, Jackson Pollock as sort of an abstract expressionist. So as an artist she really had a hatred for surrealism and these movements that kind of excluded women. Abstract expressionism was not kind to women. Clement Greenberg um, did not promote women artists as thoroughly as he promoted Pollock and Willem de Kooning and all these other abstract expressionists. And so she works to move in this movement that um, doesn't take her very seriously. This is one of her um, famous works. This is Untitled from 1949. It has this very interesting web of elusive forms whose vertical organization suggests a deliberate, readable order, leading the viewer to anticipate decoding the marks as some form of language. Um, it does kind of feel like it's this um, painting of 
um, linguistic coherence that fails because obviously it's sort of um, her own made up design and images. But there's the rhythm of the colors and lines um, connect with very much the dynamism of abstract expressionism and um, this sort of imagery. One of my favorite things about um, Lee Krasner that I just find so insane is that as Lee Krasner gets further and further into her artistic career, she starts cutting up her works of art, her works and Pollock's um, works of art and remaking new images and canvases. And it's such an intense idea to think about taking something like from Jackson Pollock that could be worth right, millions and millions of dollars and cutting it up and making her own art with it, right? And this is very much starting around 55, only a year before Pollock dies. Maybe it has some connection with their relationship. I don't know. I can only speculate. Um, but she starts to make these really interesting forms um, through col using these collaged works uh, as well as painting. So this is Milkweed from 55. You have a shark cut out forms of the work overlap and impenetrate one another, ironically functioning like Cuba Sharps in her original drawings. And combining these works sort of leads to this metaphor of collaborative art making in which individual artists must suppress their own personalities and aim to order and enter into fully artistic partnership. And so here she is working in kind of this cubist and abstract expressionist form in creating and using cubist kind of collage um, to create this famous work. And it's huge. It's this massive work that really becomes um, one of her important works during this time as she sort of faced prejudices of being sort of rejected from um, abstract expressionism. She's also starting to engage with a lot of the similar kind of action paintings that Pollock was involved in later in her life. So this is 1960 Polar Stampede. She's working in these sort of visual um, compositions of um, epic proportions and um, aggression of brushstroke and movement, visual and emotional catharsis. You could see sort of animals, figures in this sort of polar stampede and movement. So she really becomes this very famous and forceful and beautiful artist um, in her own right in painting and collage work. Again, another artist, Elaine de Kooning. She is another famous abstract expressionism, but again, a woman who's underneath her husband. So Willem de Kooning was a famous artist. That's him on the right. We just talked about him. She is a famous artist in her own right as well, but she's kind of um, underneath um, the fame of her husband. So she worked in the Black Mountain College um, with Willem de Kooning and started writing for Art News and really becomes famous for making male portraits. And we're going to talk about these because this is really phenomenal and interesting. So this is, again, as Willem de Kooning thought that you didn't need to, to separate abstraction from figurative, Elaine de Kooning really combines figurative ideas with that of abstract coloration and imagery. So in this work, Elaine de Kooning does a portrait of Harold Rosenberg, which is that famous um, critic that um, made the word action painting right in his work that we talked about previously. Um, de Kooning participates in a tradition of portraying critics that goes back at least as far as Wedderbord Monet's painting of Emile Zola. The fraught relationship between artist and critic involves mutual dependence and vulnerability. A sympathetic critic can further an artistic artist's career, and a successful artist can confirm a critic's um, perspicacity and prestige. This relationship becomes very important and very connected. And so Elaine de Kooning produces this really interesting and gorgeous abstract expressionist moment of motion and color and idea in um, this portrait of Harold Rosenberg. Now what she's really kind of gained the most fame for art historically is her portrait of J.F. Kennedy, um, John F. Kennedy in 1963. So she receives um, the major commission to produce the portrait 
of the president um, that does end up hanging in the National Portrait Gallery for the presidents. And she spends a lot of time with John F. Kennedy producing his portrait, producing this massively intense spectrum of color and light and form and interest. And it's so interesting to look at these swaths of green and gold and light blue that sort of commands attention that's very different from these other portraits of presidents that you would have seen up to this time, right? They're very neutral. They're very sort of standard looking. And you have to think that like John F. Kennedy is really one of these early artists that kind of has a different person portraying him in a portrait. And then you see that kind of continue, right, with Obama and his Kendall Wiley portrait. So she spends some time with him and there's these numerous drawings and um, studies she does of him. And even those are gorgeous, right? In her watching him do his work, in thinking about him, in connecting with him. And it's such an interesting choice that she received the commission, a woman of abstract expressionism who is not well known necessarily at the time, who had received few commissions, that she receives this massive moment in producing work. She was still working to finish the portrait when she had learned that he had been assassinated. And so it took her time to get back into this portrait and to finish painting it. But you see this really great moment of youth, of movement, of intensity, sort of him posed to move forward, to bolt to the future and movement. And it sort of really tragically ended by his death um, before this painting is finished. So moving on from gestural painting is color field painting. And as um, it's sort of thought that although these divisions between gestural and color field painting are somewhat artificial, there are both formal and conceptual differences between them. And so Rothko and other color field painters wrote a letter to the New York Times stating that we favor the simple expressionism of complex thought. We are for the large shape because it has an impact of the unequivocal. We wish to reassert the picture plane. We are for flat forms because they destroy illusion and reveal truth. Abstract art was not subjectless, as other artists had expressed, but instead could communicate the most profound subjects and elicit a deep emotional response in the viewer. So, obviously, as I previously stated, the most famous color field painter in abstract expressionism is Mark Rothko, and he emigrates from the U.S. in 1913 from a Russian Jewish family and sort of lives in New York for some time. And although he sort of starts with figurative work, um, he really moves into being well known for abstraction. And so this is one of his early works in which he is working somewhat in figurative art, but starting to slowly morph his work. And um, by 1949, after sort of this painting, um, kind of ends, right? He's going to move away from even trying to represent sort of small forms into pure abstract color field painting. This is one of his early examples of this compositional structure that he explores for sort of the new, next two decades, where you have these separated blocks of color, um, the edges are soft and irregular. There are, there's this green bar that appears to have orange around it, creating an optical flicker. You have the canvas full of movement and energy and surface, and um, the edges tend to fade and blur, um, and kind of this aesthetics of sublime. And when Rothko produces these works, he really thinks about them as symbols of spirituality and etern eternal um, concepts. And so when you look at this painting, you're not supposed to just see the color relationship, but to kind of invest yourself in this painting and in looking and kind of um, be absorbed by the work itself. So um, I was told by a professor some many years ago that when you go to look at a Rothko painting, the way for you to truly understand it, for you to get it, for you to get what Rothko was getting at, is to either stand so close to the painting that you can't really see the edges and you focus in on the center of the canvas. This can be hard because um, you don't want to upset the guards. <laughs> um, or secondly, to sit on the floor of a museum, which he loved to do. He loved to sit on the floor and to look up at the painting and be absorbed into that environment. And so when you go to look at a Rothko painting, you really have to be absorbed into 
the work itself because this is when you really start to feel um, this kind of overcoming presence of the color and the form and the ideas that Rothko really invested and really sort of the mem mesmerizing moment of how impressive and important this work was. Um, and he's, tr he's right, I've done it. Um, it is very overwhelming and beautiful and powerful to sort of stand in front of the painting and be completely absorbed by these color blocks. In the 1950s, he really started moving even more and more towards more somber colors, like these um, rust and blue. I don't know why I wrote rush and blue. Um, and starting to move in kind of these um, more sort of sad and lonely um, but beautiful colors. So this being rust and blue. Also, this is a um, commission for Harvard University in which he produces these panels. And his sort of most famous series before um, his death is um, this work, the Rothko Chapel from 1971. Rothko Chapel is this really important work and it stands as this really impressive, impressive kind of spiritual place to focus kind of on um, Rothko's work and this kind of total pictorial experience. Um, where you're connected kind of religiously to meditate, to think, to contemplate the world, and open sort of to all religions and uh, denominations. So it's shaped like an octagon and has these kind of um, purple slash black um, color block canvases that um, really create this very quiet, calming, and specific sort of connection to worship to meditation and so people come sort of from all around the world to think about life think about Rothko think about the work that he produced in this um sort of thinking about um art and life and spirituality and all these connections that sort of Rothko made tragically he did kill himself before he ever finished this work he had sort of declining health at the time and um killed himself before the paintings were even installed. And so the painting, he um, killed himself in 70, and this was finished in 71. So he unfortunately never saw sort of the completion of this work, which is quite tragic, um, but it became sort of the monument to the ending of his life um, and sort of the thought and progress of art and movement at the time and sort of the depressive landscape that kind of um, held the world um, at the time. Another really important abstract expressionist in the color field movement um, is Helen Frankenthaler. And she's very famous and very well known, um, but again, not as well known as other artists of the time. As I previously stated, that hopefully you caught on to, um, this is Clement Greenberg and this is Helen Frankenthaler in the center. And although there are a lot of scholarship that talks about um, the potential that um, Greenberg promoted her and supported her work as an artist. Um, they only dated for about five years and Frankenthaler did believe to some extent that he didn't write about her as much because they were dating and had this relationship. So he didn't promote her work potentially because of sort of negative feelings between the two of them. Um, but Frankenthaler becomes very famous in her own right and becomes really the first American painter after Pollock to use color straining of raw canvas um, to create an integration of color and ground in which foreground and background cease to exist. So what she did in her art was to pour thinly oil-based paint on her canvas, like seen here. And this would allow the paint to seep into the weave of the canvas itself. And so you would not only see the unique material of the canvas, which would um, be highly visible as the paint just sort of melted into the canvas itself, but it also kind of removed um, the artist's hand from the painting. So you didn't see brush strokes. You don't see the artist producing the work itself. You're seeing these, um, very interesting stained canvases that she produced, which she really becomes um, most well known for. And then she would take the canvas and kind of move it around, right, to sort of get the paint to move forward and backward. And you can sort of imagine that um, 
production. So here's an image. You don't have to know this work um, for um, a test or anything, but I wanted to show you some of the layers that you see in this work. Um, the Khan Academy calls it like fresco, where the oil, where the paint becomes embedded in the material of the canvas itself, making it to reveal itself. Um, so you can see in something like this how much the canvas is as much part of the work as the paint itself. So this is a really famous work by her. Uh, this is Mountain and Sea from 1952, Oil and Charcoal on Canvas. Really her first stained painting, and it marked a really big turning point in her, turning point in her life. When she was 23 and produced this work in 1952, she had just visited the landscape of Nova Scotia and visited Cape Breton and really became sort of connected with this idea of mountains and seas, right? You can see that um, in this location in Cape Breton. And so she produced this work as sort of a symbol of that trip. Um, she wrote, before I had always painted on sized and printed canvas, but my paint, my paint was becoming thinner and more fluid and cried out to be soaked, not resting. In Mountain and Sea, I put in the charcoal line gestures first because I wanted to draw in with color and shape the totally abstract memory of the landscape. I spilled on the drawing and paint from coffee cans. The charcoal lines were originally guideposts that eventually became unnecessary. So she created this um, open composition, right, where you can kind of see this free form of the landscape. There is some sense of water over here in that um, maybe this is water leading up to a mountainscape, but after that it's very much abstracted um, and built on sort of these abstractional forms. And you can see her um, charcoal uh, outlines here as well. In a 1963 interview with Art Forum magazine, the art critic Henry Geldzahler, Helen Franklin Zahler, described her process of conceptualizing her work. When you first saw a Cubist or Impressionist picture, there was a whole way of instructing the eye or the subconscious. Dabs of color had to stand for real things. It was an abstraction of a guitar or hillside. The opposite is going on now. If you have bands of blue, green, and pink, the mind doesn't think sky, grass, and flesh. These are colors, and the question is what they are doing with themselves and with each other. Sentiment and nuance are being squeezed out. So she really created this abstraction of how she felt about the mountains and the seas versus any of these shapes sort of standing for particular ideas. So it was this massive canvas that really sort of start jump started her career. This is it here. During that time around uh, 1956, she was part of the abstract expressionist group featured in Life magazine. Here she is um, with that work right here. Gorgeous picture of her. And sort of became well known for this type of work. So this is another example that I feel like even more kind of represents a landscape. This is the Bay from 1963, in which you have this massive blue proximity of violent um, color. Here we have this sort of indigo darkness and lightness that she's created. And um, it's not showing anything in particular. It's kind of amb 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 oh my goodness, ambiguous and emblematic of the quality of the viewer. But it also very much kind of looks like a piece of water moving into a piece of land. So you can see sort of the gorgeous way that she kind of moved this paint to create this kind of abstraction of environment. Now, this book mentions um, Louise Bourgeois. I had this really weird moment where um, I was totally shocked, um, and I'll tell you why, but um, she's this really phenomenal artist. She's a big figure in the feminist movement. She creates insanely impressive sculptures and installations that focus on domesticity and the family, family sexuality and the body, um, as well as the death of the subconscious. She also connects with um, events from her childhood that she considered to be therapeutic. Um, she suffered some abuse from her father, was sort of a reluctant mother, and um, I didn't even realize that we were talking about her for a second, because the image on the page was this work by her. And it totally surprised me. I was totally shocked. Um, 
because this, I feel like, is literally the worst work of Louise Bourgeois that you could have picked. Um, and so, not you, but the authors of this book. I have two major complaints. Um, I'll have to tell you one later. But, what? It, no. So, Louise Bourgeois is insanely weird, insanely prolific, and this is not a good representation of what she makes. So, Louise Bourgeois um, is a really sort of fanatical, fun, crazy, weird artist who really kind of investigates all these fears, inherent sexuality, um, it, with works like This is Janice Fleury, um, which is a combination of two penis heads, um, which kind of makes this image, um, which kind of merges into a vaginal form in the middle. And this work is based on Janice from Mythology, um, which is this two-headed um, figure. Usually, um, with two faces, one looking back into the past and one looking forward into the future. It's also um, where we get the name January. They're the god of gates, doorways, beginnings, um, and they combine sort of two ideas of kind of male and female and blah, blah, blah. So you can think about sort of um, yin and yang or like the two opposites, kind of like these ideas as well. But she created this massive series um, of Janice Fleury in which she created these sort of co-structures of penises that combine into a vaginal form in the center. So again, thinking about this two-headed creature, right? Um, almost like, haha, that's a pun, right? Um, that comes to form sort of a vaginal form in the center. So, and she's done this in like numerous materials, but focusing on this sort of construct of um, the merging of kind of two genders or two ideas um, in this sense. She's also been known for this work, which is filet, um, which is a penis, right? That's like, um, like a filet of meat, right? Um, and from 1968, and Robert Maplethorpe here um, photographed her in 1982 with this work. Um, again, sort of dealing with um, sexuality and the ideas of man versus woman. Um, in even works like um, Femme Maison from 1947, in which she is commenting on the relationship of women in the home and women's head replaced with house here, isolating their body from the outside world and keeping their minds domestic, the dehumanization of modern art. Again, this very much refers back to the second wave of feminism, like we're talking about, and these really important constructs of the things that are going on. And then some of her most famous work, which is Maman, um, which are meaning mother, which stands for the series of spiders that she's done um, from 1999 and onwards um, in bronze, in marble, in stainless steel, which are this really interesting series that thinks about, um, as it, they're sort of works as a tribute to her own mother, who was a weaver. Um, this work was kind of highly contradictory in its idea of maternity as a protector and a predator. Um, the silk of the spider is used for both cocoons as well as the binding of prey. So the spider kind of provokes fear and awe, yet um, its massive height, but kind of balanced on these slender legs, conveys an almost poignant vulnerability. So, I mean, this is the kind of work that Louise Bourgeois is known for. I mean, you can even pop in, I brought up this video and I was like kind of watching where they call her Spider Woman um, that I'll throw up on canvas, but it's like, you give me this? I don't know. I was totally blown away. Um, maybe I'm totally crazy. I have no idea. Anyway. We are going to very briefly dip into post-war European art um, in sort of glancing at one particular artist. So um, chapter 17 is about post-war European art. We kind of have looked at this already, so I will sort of show you where we're going to move from here. But of course, Europe is completely damaged and hurt from the murdering and genocide um, of World War II, along with the destruction of important cities. So. We have the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. We have 
um, sort of fear about nuclear warfare as well as Pearl Harbor in 1941. We also have um, sort of artists having not much faith in um, sort of coming back from this that they had in World War One. They had more sort of um, desire to improve life, like with Bauhaus or De Stahl. But instead, um, post-war European art is sort of more existential. So existentialism became the dominant philosophical response to the madness and pointless violence seemingly endemic to Western civilization. We have the theater of the absurd, as well as skepticism towards existing conventions, traditional themes, and techniques. We talked about two artists, actually, that are kind of post-war European art that are mentioned in this chapter, so Gia Cometti and Francis Bacon. So the only other artist that I want to look at from this chapter um, is Lucian Freud, and he's a really famous artist, um, really interesting in his production of sort of the quote-unquote visual fact in which he um, does these sort of very realistic and intense portraits of individuals. So he's actually the grandson of Sigmund Freud, which is very interesting and kind of random. Um, but his family left Berlin for England during World War II. And the book says he has um, an uncompromising devotion to the physical presence of the sitter is such that the resulting portrait, realized with an obsessive command of line and texture, can seem the product of a clinically cold and analytic mind. And not since the 1920s had figures been examined with such inflinching eye and tight linear precision. And he sort of um, paints a lot of images of his friends and family members, never sort of professional models, and kind of had them assume sort of strange and feeling poses, whose bodies are far from idealized, and whose unidealized flesh is tinged with blood and swollen with muscle and fat that lie beneath the surface. So not only is he sort of known for um, these kind of really weird um and unsettling depictions oh my goodness of individuals like girl with white dog um but he's also well known for his portraits of um, his self portraits of himself in which he's painted himself over and over again and you can see the way that he uses brush strokes and the way that he depicts um skin is really different than anybody we've seen um in you know something like uh, 60 years. So the way that he's depicting color and shape and skin is really something that we haven't seen in a long time from artists um, depicting the nude and human figure. The other work that the book talks about um, by Lucian Freud is Naked Man Back View from 1991 to 92, Oil on Canvas. And this is a famous work of Lee Bowery, um, who was a performer in London at the time. And again, similarly to um, Louise Bourgeois, I was semi-shocked. Um, this edition of the book is published in 2013, um, and this is the quote that we have about, um, <laughs> Lee Bowery. Um, it's a painting of an Australian transvestite designer and performance artist, Lee Bowery, whose gender and gender-bending provocations made him a star of London's club and fashion scene from the early 1980s until his death in 1944. Now, let me tell you, um, people do not use the word transvestite anymore. That is, usually was used pretty negatively to describe someone who, um, dressed as a woman. Um, and it's also sort of severely inaccurate as far as, um, who Lee Bowery was. And so, um, it was interesting to kind of look at the way that the book talks about this painting and um, who Lee Bowery was as an individual. This is um, Lucian Freud painting him in his studio. But I mean, Lee Bowery was an amazing, really crazy, interesting British performance artist whose work um, may be slightly quote-unquote feminine, feminine in that he wears dresses I mean I guess like if we're still using that in 2013 when we write this book but I mean he's influenced people like Boy George um, who's here and wrote sort of a whole musical on Lee Bowery um, Taboo and uh, Lee Bowery has influenced really famous um, fashion um, designers like this is Alexander McQueen or um, what is his name? Rick Owens, um, in which uh, Lee Bowery did this work here on the left. And so 
when we talk about him and him as an artist who and who dies in 1994 um and he dies of aids um AIDS complications with AIDS um, in 1994, which is a big problem for men um, in New York City at this time. And so it really sort of is not a good depiction um, or representation of who Lee Bowery is at all. So that was kind of sh shocking. So when you instead think about who Lee Bowery is, how this painting is um, shown, it's really this sort of gorgeous depiction of a body from behind um, where this performer is sort of looking off to something at his left, maybe something in more of an unclassical pose of Degas that isn't necessarily so um, inherently objectifying. It kind of rattles the viewer's expectations of the nude and makes you rethink sort of how you're viewing and depicting and thinking about the naked body, um, as well as I couldn't get a really good close-up of this work um, online, but the way that Freud uses brushwork to transform Bowery's skin into a harsh terrain of myriad hues with greenish crevices and thick white highlights, um, as the book says, is really sort of part of sort of depicting the realness and the power of something like um, Lee Bowery's naked body, right? So it really doesn't do any justice to call him um, a transvestite, which is not really an appropriate word. Um, anymore. So that's another take. Um, this is commentary from Stephanie. Um, yeah, I know. I'm not funny. So the second artistic movement that we are talking about this week is pop art. And pop art is really going to help us move into process and conceptual art next week. So it arrived officially in 1962, but pop art approached the issue of America's growing political and cultural dominance using quite different means, often deploying, it, deploying an insider's familiarity with the visual language of consumer culture to spark ironic tension. Arnie informed a great deal of the work produced by American and British pop artists during the 50s and 60s, and they very much embraced mass media imagery despised by abstract expressionists. Pop artists engaged in a simultaneous critique of the pretensions of high art and empty materialism of consumer culture. You'll see sort of this difference between pop art versus abstract expressionism. Andy Warhol said that pop artists did images that anybody walking down Broadway could recognize in a split second. Comics, picnic tables, men's trousers, celebrities, shower curtains, refrigerators, Coke bottles, and the great modern things that abstract expressionists tried not to notice. They said they didn't want to sit and paint and have revolutionary moments, but wanted to take everyday objects and place them directly in their art. Pop art was not embraced by everyone. Um, abstract expressionists thought it was quite vulgar. But you had a great um, group of young um, artists in this generation that felt that abstract expressionism needed to be ended and to sort of move forward with the new um, artistic ideas. So. Pop art actually starts in Britain in the 1950s, so we're going to look at two or three, three total, um, pop artists in Britain that sort of help to move forward pop art in the United States. Richard Hamilton is one of the big figures of pop art in Britain. They really kind of wanted to experience... <coughs> prosperity and mass consumption after dealing with some wartime issues and also very much believed that um, the medium is the message. And so um, Richard Hamilton started um, with the production of this work, Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing from 1956, which is a collage on paper. And very much his work is kind of very much connected to Marcel Duchamp. We're going to see a lot of ready-mades and the use of reoccurring images and objects. This is a modern apartment uh, with a pinup girl and her muscle man mate um, whose Tootsie Pop um, barbell prophecies the pop movement on its label. Like Adam and Eve in Consumer's Paradise, the couple have furnished their apartment with products of mass culture. So you have a television, a tape recorder, a large cover of a comic book, which was a well-known comic book at that time. You have the Ford emblem. You have advertising for a vacuum cleaner, more specifically the Hoover, as you can see right here and um, here as well. 
ironically enough, um, Hoovers are very much part of pop art and the movement towards ready-mades. Jeff Koons has done it as well with his production of Hoovers. Here is that um, from 81 to sort of connect you with contemporary art. And then through the window, you have the production of um, The Jazz Singer, which was a film um, at that time. And let's see. Came out. Um, it was kind of one of those early talky films and um, where you could hear voices. But it's really interesting because it's kind of this uh, intensely racist work. Um, yes, he is dressed um, in blackface in this film. So this is interesting kind of playing in the background, this other sort of uh, interesting connection with um, society and pop culture. And so this work is kind of satirical and antagonistic. Um, in simple terms, pop artists looked at the world in which they lived and examined the objects and image around them with intensity and penetration, frequently making the viewer conscious of the omnipresence for the first time, sort of rich with this kind of irony and humor that he's produced. Of these like little figures living their kind of um, sexy and fun lifestyle, right? With their ham on the table um, as well. For whatever reason, this work reminds me of the 13 going on 30 house that um, Matt makes for Jenna. I don't know why. Her dream house or whatever. Um, probably because of the weird flatness of the figures. Um, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but it always reminds me of that. David Hockney is another really famous British pop artist from the time. He gained a lot of recognition for his work before he even graduated from college, um, mostly because of his media image of his peroxide hair and granny glasses and gold jacket. Um, he was also homosexual, and we'll talk about that as well. And he um, used his own life and the lives of his friends and lovers um, their faces, figures, houses, and interiors to produce pop art. So although his images aren't um, very much as connected with materialism and um, marketing as some of the other artists, his work is very much connected to sort of the kind of lifestyle and residence in California. And um, so it became this like synthetic image of that lifestyle. So the swimming pool became a big image to him um, in sort of creating this very flat um, Matisse pattern style. Um, it's kind of the epitome of expectant st stillness. It was relaxed and sensual. You had this sort of great modernist building connected with how this uh, diving board kind of juts out and this splash itself. You, Although you know a person is there and has splashed in the water, theoretically, um, you don't see the figure. So just the white lines and the turquoise water, which has sort of no movement in it, um, represents this kind of moment um, in time. He himself was really interested in um, how you would see a splash in real life because it's such this momentary um, event that happens, right? It moves by so quickly that you don't even see it. And so um, often Hockney would take a picture of something he wanted to produce and then repaint it. Um, so something like a, the splash, he did that. A bigger splash, that is. Another one of his really famous works is um, Portrait of an Artist Pool with Two Figures from 72. This work, I'm mostly bringing it up not only because it's famous and well-known and, again, has this imagery of the swimming pool, um, but that it's sold for $90.3 million. And um, it's the most that any living artist has been paid for a work of art while they're still alive. Um, he's, like, 82 now, still alive. Um, but again, he didn't produce a, um, idea that he saw, but he recreated the idea in his head through photographs. So he would take photographs and images like this one of, um, his friends and lovers. This being his boyfriend here, and this is here, his Hockney on the left. And then he produced this work. So it was a work that was supposed to be um, for an event. And he started working on it and painted it for 18 hours a day for two weeks until it was finished. This sort of massive painting. And you can see some more information about it if you want to watch A Bigger Splash. is a film that sort of mixes fiction with nonfiction about this painting from 73. 
some of his other work that seems very connected to um, cubism is his work with collage he collages um, photography to kind of create all of these moments um, together it, it feels very much invested in cubism because Brock and Picasso would create movement through repetition, right? Trying to combine all of these different movements together. You could even think of Duchamp and his new descending staircase or something like that. And so he's produced all of these different photographs of all these different moments to create one scene, one image of all these different times. So he does landscapes like this, um, like this Scrabble game, really phenomenal works in this sort of um, style that he's also well known for. Pauline Body is another really famous um, British artist at the time, being a female. Um, again, not really a movement that um, permitted a whole lot of quote-unquote female figures, um, but her paintings and collages became really famous and sort of a criticism of the world she lived in and kind of heralded 1970s feminism. And she was really considered an it girl because she was a model and a photographer. And so people didn't really take a lot of her work seriously at the time. And so she's really kind of thought of now as this kind of emblem of um, work that kind of worked against sort of the misogyny of the art world at the time. So this is the only blonde in the world from 63 in producing an image of Marilyn Monroe, who we're going to see a couple times here with um, Andy Warhol as well. And she kind of flanks her on both sides with this vibrant color pattern and abstract shapes and produces this image of Marilyn Monroe. And she's very glamorous. She's strutting along the street in her white dress, heels and fur and blonde locks. It's probably from a press shot from the Seven Year Itch, which she was um, premiering. And Bodie was fascinated with Monroe, felt an affinity with this um, modern starlet, an era that was more open to female sexuality and then the confinements of that sexualization. Um, Marilyn Monroe was very powerful and oppressed due to her beauty and Bodhi kind of felt the same way. She was sympathetic to this idea that um, people didn't take Bodhi seriously because she was beautiful and she was blonde and she felt like um, they took her about as seriously as people took Marilyn Monroe. And so she often felt that when, even when Bodhi went out to act and try to get actresses gigs, she'd always be kind of typecast as like the dumb blonde. And so she produces this work, um, kind of thinking about Monroe and this kind of abstract shapes that are kind of consuming her and her body, right, um, in this work. She did other works like Bum. Um, I stumbled upon this work this week. Um, I find it hilarious and funny um, that she made for like someone's cabinet of curiosities or something. This is a portrait of her butt. Um, but she had a tragic death at the age of 28, so we didn't get to see much of her work. Probably more familiar with pop art in America um, and sort of the artists that follow with that. Uh, pop art had an appeal to Americans who were living in an even more saturated popular environment than Britain. They wanted to move away from the heroic rhetoric and grand painterly gestures of abstract expressionism. And then Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns were very much heirs to Duchamp and sometimes have been referred to as Neo-Dada. And they rely very much on ready-mades, found objects, consumer products, bric-a-brac, and detritus of modern life. So Robert Rauschenberg is one of the main pop artists that we're going to start with here. And he's really sort of one of the early artists to develop America's pop vocabulary. He studied with Joseph and Annie Albers um, from um, Black Mountain College. I believe we talked about her last week with her um, weaves, um, her tapestries, and um, worked with John Cage as well. And he sort of correcting, collecting objects and producing collages and silkscreen work and really became this kind of um, interesting development between abstract expressionism and pop art. So this is one of his famous works that I wanted to talk about. This is Buffalo 2 from 1964, oil and silk screen on canvas. Here you have him really kind of uniting the world of art and politics with uniquely American images. You have JFK during the presidential debate. You have some space race ideas. You have a bald eagle and then kind of iconic 
um, consumer products, uh, cafeteria, there's a Coke label in here, keys. Um, so bringing this connection with Americanness and American ideas and patriotism. And it's really this massive eight foot tall canvas um, that really where he appropriates and collects newspaper and magazine images and his own photographs to kind of make this portrait of the country at the time. So this is, um, we're coming into the Vietnam War shortly and sort of dealing with these major issues um, in the United States, right? We just got out of World War II, moving into a new war. And um, Robert Rauschenberg reflects on that in his work. Jasper Johns is very much also in the vein, similar to Robert Rauschenberg. They were both friends and worked together at times. Um, Target with Four Faces is one of Jasper John's famous works. Um, he often used targets and flags along with numbers, letters, and words, and maps of the U.S. Um, because they were objects people were familiar with, and then he could kind of manipulate them to get his own idea. And he destroyed all of his pre-1954 work and then produced these kind of pop art works. And in this work, Seems kind of weird and unremarkable now, but they were, it was quite full of hidden meetings at the time. There are everyday signs of visual communication. Um, at the time, you would not have seen a target that much. Um, it was very much a sign of, um, it was very much an image that was combined to military or firearm settings and how we observe um, and in turn are observed. And Jasper Johns takes this image and really puts it into the mind and consciousness of the American people and rethinks this image. So something that maybe is not um, as weird or interesting to us now was weird and interesting then. And then he mounted above this target four plaster casts taken from a single model over a period of several months and created this wooden um, lid that you could shut it and look at the figures and then shut it. Um, kind of like the movement of a blinking eye even though the eyes of the faces themselves are moving. And so a lot of this work has to do kind of with implied violence, um, with the connection between scene and being targeted. Um, potentially that um, Jasper Johns was a closeted gay man in the South during the era of Joseph McCarthy. Joseph McCarthy may have made him feel like he was a target um, or an enemy to the United States. And so some of his work kind of reflects that. So this is another one, Target with Plaster Cast, where you break down sort of bodily objects in the same sort of um, hinged little cupboards. Klaus Oldenburg is really one of my favorite pop artists. And um, he also works with his wife on a lot of his later work, um, Kusti van Bruggen. Um, and he really asserts his work into the public sphere and really embraces pop and pop culture, creating these par these massive public large sculptures of everyday objects and advertisement and graffiti, um, etc. So one of his early works is The Store um, from 1961, in which he produces this whole sort of kind of convenience store, this celebratory images of consumption and objects of everyday life from the storefronts of Manhattan, kind of celebrating downtown cafeterias and venues and restaurants, and produced it right in these little kind of um, spaces that you would go and you'd pick out a dessert, right, from a pastry shop or something like that. And he produced a whole um, exhibition like this. And sort of this sort of jumpstarts some of his work with consumption and with American life. One of his other famous works that I really like as well is Lipstick Ascending on Caterpillar Tracks from 74. You have this monumental lipstick that comes out of this military vehicle. Um, and it was placed there um, kind of illegally, I suppose, on the campus of Yale University amidst the 1969 student protests of the Vietnam War. Although it's kind of sort of playful, it was also kind of deeply critical of that time period. So he worked with students there, and it really became a critique of um, anti-war protests. So it juxtaposed the implied U.S. obsession with beauty and consumption, both fueled and distracted from the ongoing violence in Vietnam. So as a part of this work, he produced 
Um, this is a collage that he produced kind of to look like the idea, and this was the original work here um, in which the lipstick was an inflatable object on top of a um, tank. And so Klaus Oldenburg and these students um, were involved in this protest, which becomes very popular too in the 70s, which we're going to see here um, next week in that protesting the Vietnam War and students not wanting to be involved in it um, and creating works like this. And this work stayed on canvas for about uh, 10 months, and they actually um, commissioned it to stay there. So now it does live there um, at Yale University as um, a metal structure. So it's like this here. Klaus Oldenburg and his wife have gone on to make many of these sort of lowly objects like clothespins, um, matchsticks and foodstuffs into these sort of monumental sc sculptures. So transforming the commonplace into the extraordinary. Um, art should be literally made of the ordinary world. Its space should be our space. It's time, our time. Its objects are ordinary objects. The reality of art will replace reality and really sort of conquered democratic urban spaces with this work. So he's pretty well known for his public art um, in the production of these works. This one a lot of people know, this is Spoonbridge and Cherry from 88 that is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I love how it looks in the summer versus the winter. Kind of looks like ice cream, right? You can even buy a snow globe. This is another one of my favorites, um, drop bowl with scattered slices and peels. Kind of part of a pool that you have this bowl, it looks like it's been dropped with apple slices and peels and they kind of roll out in this sort of dramatic way. Um, really phenomenal idea about art and everyday objects and pop art. Um, I love Klaus Oldenburg. Okay, next artist we're going to talk about is Roy Lichtenstein. Roy Lichtenstein's work before if you haven't um, known it or not. And his primary subject um, are these comic strips or advertisements and colors. Um, that are sort of part of modern America. And he either usually um, looked at violent action or sentiment romance um, to produce these works. Um, in the 1960s, commercial art was considered beneath contempt by the art world. In the early 1950s, with the rise of abstract expressionism, 19th century American narrative and genre paintings were at the nadir of their reputation among critics and collectors. Paraphrasing, particularly the paraphrasing of despised images, became a paramount feature of Lichtenstein's work. Well before finding his signature mode of expression in 61, Lichtenstein called attention to the artifice of convention and taste that permeated art and society. What others dismissed as trivial fascinated him as classic and idealized, in his words, a purely American mythological subject matter. So you can really kind of see this in some of his work. This is Wham! Um, from... 1963, in which you have this plane um, shooting down its enemy, which is featured in the the right of the same image in this kind of diptych. And it came directly out of um, a DC-produced comic book um, in February of 1962. So a, a comic book called All American Men of War. Oh, great. Um, almost exactly the same, right, in that it says, I press the fire control and ahead of me rocket is blazed through the sky and the shooting down of this plane. So very much, again, connected to not only kind of what's going on in the Vietnam War and what had just happened in World War II in connection with the folly of war, but starting to look at some of these sort of banal um, comic books as um, high art. And he uses primary color, as you can see, and um, we'll look at that in some other works, but mostly like blues and reds and yellows. So um, a lot of his other work that is um, usually pretty well known is those images of women and men, these kind of romance melodramas. Um, like this woman in a tragic situation was where she says, I don't care, I'd rather sink than call Brad for help. Um, this teary-eyed woman in a turbulent scene, um, this sort of cliched melodrama, right? It's really silly. It's kind of stupid. It has no context, right? But he created um, this painting from like older comic book ideas. So he does this by using Bende dots. So this kind of mechanical way 
um, that comic books were to produce in these tiny dots, he reuses it um, and paints them by hand. So he uses a um, like a mechanism to draw the circles exactly um, in perfect shape, but then paints them in himself. So he creates these massive works that he's kind of hand painted in these Bende dots um, to produce this look of comic books. Other works like, oh, Jeff, I love you too, but um, is another famous work by him. You have this beautiful blue eye, blonde hair, full lipped woman, the sad eyes with a doomed love affair and these fantasy dreams. Um, I read somewhere that someone called this his Mona Lisa, right? This sort of gorgeous woman figure on the phone in this tragic love. So um, another very famous work by him continuing to sort of use comic books in the idea of comic book design. I saw this um, painting recently and it connected right away um, to Lichtenstein looking back at art and the producing, um, what the hell, of famous art of the time. Um, so this is Lichtenstein, the artist studio, the dance in which he copies um, Henry Matisse's dance. And then ironically enough, I stumbled upon a David Hockney painting, The Dancers from 2014, um, that's very much connected with these paintings. Um, but these are like little yoga people. The final artist that we are going to talk about is Andy Warhol. And of course, he is the king of pop art, right? Everyone's heard of him. Just like Jackson Pollock of the Abstract Expressionists, we have Andy Warhol of the pop artists. Very well known as an artist in the production of his commercial products and arts like Coca-Cola bottles, Campbell's soup cans, Brillo cartons, we'll look at all of them. Um, he was homosexual. Again, another gay man in art history that um, has made an appearance this week. He was very famous. He A lot of his work involved silkscreen printing in which he produced um, silkscreened images. So we'll see that as we move through here. So. A lot of his early images, this is Campbell's Soup Cans from 1962, um, he took the idea of a painting as a medium and invention and originality and reproduced images of packaging, right? The repetition of this idea over and over again, like they were on the supermarket shelves or assembly line, um, it was really considered one of the greatest breakthroughs in art since Ready Mades by Duchamp. And it became this kind of symbol of his work, right? Campbell's soup cans and all their flavors in these 32 panels. You can see that each change is to like black bean, cream of celery, cream of asparagus, etc. Um, Warhol said that he um, ate Campbell's soup every day for lunch for 32 years, or for 20 years, and um, exhibited this as part of sort of um, that idea. He also produced things like Coke bottles. Um, I love this quote um, about how he sort of viewed the Coke and the idea of Coke as a product. He wrote in his 1975 autobiography, you can be watching the TV and see Coca-Cola and you know that the president drinks Coke, Liz Taylor drinks Coke, and just think, you can drink Coke too. And a Coke is a Coke and no amount of money can get you a better Coke than the one Bob on the corner is drinking which is really interesting idea that he is producing images of everyday objects that anyone can own and making them sort of high art, making them important, making them valuable. And so this is really sort of this massive moving point for art and art history and using everyday objects and literally reproducing them the exact same way as art and high art. And of course, Andy Warhol became super famous and super wealthy from doing this, from just rethinking things that have been created by other people, right? This sort of ready-made production. This is the Brillo box, if you've never seen this one, a very famous as well. So because of this, he called his studio the factory. It was a party location for many intellectuals, playwrights, drag queens, bohemian street people, celebrities, etc. And um, came to sort of party and work with Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol also made people celebrities in his own right. He talked about 15 minutes of fame. Um, and so he became really well known for that. So this is like a letter from um, the realty where he lived about how, um, 
having parties was against his lease. You can read it if you like. So there are a lot of different parts of Andy Warhol's life. I'm going to bring him up again next week very briefly. Um, and we can't talk about all of them, obviously. But we had figures like Edie Sedgwick, who became the Girl of the Year in 1965. And she stored, she was in a lot of short films by Warhol. This is her here. And um, she was beautiful and rich and very damaged. And um, she started working very intimately with Warhol and they became sort of best friends and this very sort of dramatic relationship they had between them in which he produced all these films where she was the leading figure and she became sort of um, this image that he produced over and over and over again. So you can watch this video I'll have in the links again um, of um, Warhol interviewing Sedgwick and the relationship kind of Warhol kind of became bored and um, they ended up breaking up because she started dating Bob Dylan and um, there was also the fact that in one of their last official movies Warhol said that he wanted something where Edie commits suicide at the end um, which was sort of awful and sort of so the relationship started to break down and she did end up dying at 28 um, from drug and alcohol addiction. So she's kind of a tragic figure. Um, but she had this sort of momentary fame um, and impression on Andy Warhol's work. I previously stated, Marilyn Monroe became a popular image amongst artists like um, Bodhi that we talked about before. And so uh, Warhol produced this silk screen of Marilyn Monroe. He was turning his eyes to folk heroes and movie stars like Presley and Elizabeth Taylor, as well as Marilyn Monroe. And he, in his early works, he started off using um, media images that were already produced. This is like a publicity still from the film Niagara, um, in which he used and then reinterpreted in his work. And he removed the 3D contour of her space through shade and made this manufactured image of her that looked very flat and um, kind of in connection with... Um, religious devotion. So we're going to see that here shortly. But he wanted to eliminate the signature of the artist and depict images of his time. And also he would often make the silk screen color register imperfectly. So sometimes they'd be slightly off with the last one that was in there to make it even more artificial and sad. Um, and a lot of this underscored sort of the mechanical nature of the process he was using and to also sort of um, contemplate the fate of um, Marilyn Monroe re recently dying um, as well. And so he reproduced this image over and over and over again. And um, it very much was about um, our connection with pop art and how much we worship these figures um, and how looking at kind of the same image over and over and over again um, makes it almost mean nothing to us, right? That it removes sort of the power of the image as well and makes you feel emptier. This was another famous one from 1962 in which he made 25 images in color and 25 in black and white and um, did this so that it would look with this connection of religious imagery to something like a diptych where you have um, these images of like the Virgin Mary or Christ that you would worship and sort of contemplate um, these religious moments. And so he created it within months of her dying in 1962. So these two versions are kind of showing this relationship between life and death and between sort of how um, people emulate her and think of this her as this like symbol of beauty and power and strength. And you kind of idolize and worship this flat, unimportant figure, right? Although we don't get to talk about it much in this class, Andy Warhol is well known for producing films as well. Um, I've put two film stills here and I'll put the two links in um, the on the Moodle and um, so you can go and click and watch some of them if you would like. And you can also watch um, Andy Warhol eating a hamburger, which is hilarious. It was made by a Danish filmmaker, Jorgen Leith. Um, he made 66 Scenes of America and he um, had this intimate moment of Warhol eating a hamburger for this um, video. And so, okay, so next week we are going to focus in on sort of process art, conceptual art, and land art. Um, what I'm thinking as I sort of rethink um, this structure that I showed you, um, so this week we're doing 16, 
1719. And what I'm thinking is we will probably do um, 18, 20, 22, 23 um, next week and then sort of um, try to do 24 through 27 the week after. So fingers crossed, I think we can uh, figure it out. Um, I will keep you updated though, but otherwise I will talk to you guys next week.